Let me present, let me present the practice of the way you did it. And let me start with an example. Um, this class is always sort of, I try to explain where integral will show up, but there's no denying that compared to calculus one, it's very short on example. So this is a pretty classic example of the trapezoid rule from a pharmacy. Um, so suppose a drug is being administered to a patient. By uh, an IV, let's say. So it's being constantly administered. Well, the doctor or the nurse or the hospital or whatever controls the rate. The drug is administered and so you can give somebody 10 milligrams per hour via IV something like that so in this hospital was a database, there's, <laughs> there's going to be a record of these rates. Let's say for simplicity that we just note the rate the drug is being administered at every hour. Maybe in the real world, we do it more or less frequently. But we wind up with a table like this. And because we're looking at the rate of change of this drug, you know, milligrams per hour, that's our rate. We're getting information here about the derivative of the concentration. So maybe we have a table like this. And we ask, well, what's the total amount of the drug that's been administered? Well, per the fundamental theorem of calculus, which we also call the net change theorem. The net change in the amount of drug in this patient's body is the integral from zero to four of the derivative of the rate of change. So integrating the rate of change gives you the net change. 
And we ask, okay, what is this integral? And of course, the problem that immediately hits us in this example, and a lot of real world examples, is that we're not given an equation for C of T. We're just given data on a table. So there is no, I mean, since we're not given C prime of T, I should say, there is no possibility that we're going to use the fundamental theorem of calculus, find the antiderivative. So what can we do? Well, we can try to approximate this integral numerically. And the classic way of doing this is the trapezoidal rule. And the trapezoidal rule says, okay, we have some data points. We want the integral. We want the area under the curve only we don't know what the curve is. We just have these isolated data points. <laughs> the trapezoidal rule says, well, we don't know what the curve is. Let's assume that it's just a bunch of straight line segments. And I mean, obviously, this isn't going to be perfectly true most of the time, but, well, we're doing an approximation. What can we say? We don't know what the curve is exactly. And the reason this is called the trapezoidal rule, we want the area under the curve. We're treating the curve as if it's a bunch of straight line segments. You see, we can break this region up into four trapezoids. Hence, trapezoidal rule. And we find the area of each of these trapezoids in turn. And, um, and we add them together and there's our approximation. Let me, do I have a correct number of points? Let me try to make this fit that data. So Here's how we're going to do this. We are given on that table of data, we're given the sides of the trapezoid. Um, this is our zero, one, two, three, four, and five. Wait. And Okay, this is what comes from just lagging the trapezoid without looking at the data. Let's uh, try to make a more accurate picture. Zero is 10, then 25, 27, 27, So something like this. And here 
are our trapezoids. And we've got our observations at time zero, time one, time two, time three, time four. There we go. And let me consign that to oblivion. So we know um, the sides of these tra trapezoids from the data. This is 10. This is one, one hour. This is 25. And again, that's one, one hour. 27. 27, 20. Not really drawn to scale, but good enough for our purposes. So if we happen to know the formula for the area of a trapezoid, then we can find the areas of these trapezoids and add them together. And I phrase that as a hypothetical, but you can imagine that I would not come in here if I didn't know that. If we call this side one, we call this side two, we call this the base. Then we take the base, and if this were a rectangle, it would be the base times the height. We have two heights. And for a trapezoid, it becomes the base times the average of the heights. So the base times the average of the sides of the trapezoid. <laughs> and that one half, we can pull out one half times the base times the sum of the sides. So there is the area of a trapezoid. You don't need to memorize that. You just need to, well, to memorize or to learn what's coming next. But let's apply this to this specific example. We probably won't have room on this frame. So the bases are all one here. For this first trapezoid, one half the base. So one half one times 10 plus 25. And then for the second trapezoid, the base is again one. So one half times one, 25 plus 27 for the second trapezoid. Then there is no denying these examples always start to wear out their welcome. This third trapezoid is 27 plus 27. And 
this vast trapezoid, 27 plus 20. And we could just plug this into a calculator and call it a day. But let's try to recognize a pattern. I mean, we see that one half times one in all of these. So one half times one, we can pull out. And let me just re. One half times one is one half. And then we've got 10 plus 25 plus 25 plus 27 plus 27 plus 27. See, 27, 27, 27. We've got four 27s. <clears throat> and we've got a 20. And we see a bunch of repeating numbers here 25 and 25, 27 and 27. 27 and 27, these numbers all show up in pairs, except for the very first and the very last number. And why that is, once again, take this 25. This 25 showed up when we were finding that area because it was the right side of the trapezoid. It showed up when we were finding that area because it's the left side of the trapezoid. So it shows up twice. Only this 10, Unclutter that. Um, likewise, this 27, it's the right hand side of that trapezoid, and it's the left hand side of that trapezoid, so it shows up twice. The only numbers that don't show up twice are that. 10 and that 20. The 10 is just the left hand side of one of the trapezoids. The 20 is just the right hand side. So, I mean, I don't know if this would speed things up now that we've got in this far, but just for pattern recognition purposes, we've got the first value plus twice the second value plus twice the third value plus twice the fourth value plus the fifth value. So if we look at this table, each of these, this 25, this 27, that 27, those are values on the table. And you see that those three values <laughs> show up twice in the sum. Two times the second value, two times the third value, two times the fourth value. 
the first value and the last value show up only once. That 10 and that 20 don't have twos in front of them. So that's the trapezoid rule. We could put this into a calculator and get our approximation, but let's try to write this down as a formula. So let's say we have a function f of x. Just like with the midpoint rule, we're going to pick n. And just like the midpoint rule, the trapezoid rule doesn't break if you have different size intervals. I mean, if you have data that looks like this, there is absolutely nothing stopping you from using the trapezoid rule, but we're just going to assume for simplicity that all of these rectangles are of the same length, delta x. So we've got this interval. It's broken into equal sized pieces. Let's call these points x0, x1, x2, x3, x4. In this particular case, there are six of them, but there are however many there are. There are x sub n of these. And the trapezoidal rule says if we're trying to integrate across this interval, we've got some function here. that we're trying to integrate. It's going to be delta x over two. That didn't show up so much in this example because delta x is one. So one over two in this example, times f of the first value plus twice f of the next value, plus twice f of the next value. And all of these values are going to have twos in front of them. except for the first value and the last value. The first value and the last value do not have twos in front of them. And again, this, this trapezoid rule, is just what we used here. I mean, we recognize that delta x is one, first of all. I guess we really recognize that from the table rather than computing it. 
But once we recognize that delta x is one, we had delta x over two times the first value, c prime of zero, plus twice the next value, c prime of one, plus twice the next value, plus twice, c 10, 25, 27, 27. Nope, we are at, Yes, yes, sorry. Uh, plus twice that repeated 27 confused me, but twice our next value. And now we're at our last value. And our last value and our first value don't get multiplied by anything. I mean, they get multiplied by the one half but there isn't that two in front of them. This is, let's see, a goofy software always takes a while to load up. I'll bet Google will do this for us if we, if we ask it to. <laughs> but now our calculator software is in the way. Well, we wanted one half, one divided by two times, oh, Whatever. Here's our calculator now. We did not succeed in saving any time. But one divided by two times. Would you by now? I have memory of a goldfish. So 10, 25, 27, 27. 10 plus 2 times 25 plus 2 times 27 plus 2 times 27 plus 20. And we approximate the total drug amount that this patient has been exposed to as 94 milligrams. So that's the trapezoidal rule. And I mean, you can always do is the trapezoidal rule. I mean, I, I've presented this as a technique for working with tables, but I mean, properly speaking, if you wanted to <laughs> use the trapezoidal rule to, um, to estimate some integral, there's nothing stopping you from using the trapezoidal rule. I think being able to use it when you have tables is really the trapezoidal rule's strength, though. If you just have an arbitrary function that you're trying to integrate, there's another rule we can use that is stronger than the trapezoidal rule. And by stronger, I mean that um, we need fewer rectangles to get better results. And this is a Simpson's rule. <clears throat> Normally, when I write a name on a board, I have some idea who that 
person was. I confess that Simpson is a mystery to me. But Simpson's rule is the most complicated rule. Well, I actually think Simpson's rule is easier to use than the midpoint rule because you don't have to find a bunch of midpoints. Um, but when you see it written down, it at least looks like the most complicated of the three rules. And I'm going to write Simpson's rule down, and I'm going to briefly tell you where it comes from. So Simpson's rule requires you to break your interval apart into an even number of pieces. It's the only rule that has a requirement like that. And Simpson's rule requires all of these pieces be of the same length. And again, Simpson's rule is the only one of these three rules that requires that. We've assumed in the past that we have these equally sized rectangles. But I mean, for using midpoints, I mean, the midpoint rule just says, use the midpoints of your rectangles. And there's nothing stopping you from using midpoints if these intervals are not of the same size. And the trapezoidal rule says, well, we have our curve. We're going to break this interval into pieces. And on each of these pieces, we're going to act as if our curve is a straight line. And again, there's nothing, there's nothing in that that requires the pieces be the same size. Um, we've assumed that the pieces are the same size so that we get some nice simplification and a nice form of a, but it's not a requirement requirement to use the midpoint rule. This is a requirement to use Simpson's rule. But I mean, this isn't, I'm stating this as if, oh, this is some great requirement. But I mean, if you just have, I guess I erased it, but if you just have some integral that you want to approximate. And you are working on a calculator, for example, or working on a computer, I should say. You can just tell the computer, okay, 1,000 is a large even number. Delta X is going to be that. Run Simpson's rule with those parameters. So, I mean, these are restrictions, but they're not really restricting us, if that makes sense. 
And Simpson's rule, let me make sure I get the order of these terms correctly. It says, okay, we're integrating from A to B. We've got delta x over three yeah, this time. Um, the midpoint rule is delta x over one. The trapezoidal rule is delta x over two. Simpson's rule, delta x over three. And now Simpson's rule initially looks like the trapezoidal rule. We've got the function evaluated at the first point of the interval. We've got the function evaluated at the last point in the interval. We're going to have four times the function evaluated at the next point. And then what makes Simpson's rule at least look more complicated than the trapezoidal rule is that we're going to start alternating. We're going to have two times the function evaluated at the next value. We're going to have four times the function evaluated at the next value. We're going to have two and you see that we alternate between four and two, four and two, until our very last value, when we'll have neither four nor two, but just the function evaluated at the last value. So that's Simpson's rule. It's, I mean, it's very plug and play. I mean, I, it's tedious to do it by hand, and I'm not going to deny that, but you just, you just find delta x and you find these values and you plug them into the formula. <laughs> Where Simpson's rule comes from, it's quite interesting, might be overselling it, but I think it's kind of interesting. Simpson's rule comes from polynomial regression. Simpson's rule says, suppose that we have a curve and we want to estimate the area. Let's draw two equally sized rectangles like that. This gives us three points on the curve. Through three points on a curve, there is a quadratic. It's possible to draw a parabola Let me try to make this parabola less hideous. It's possible to draw a parabola
going through those points. And we can find the area under a parabola using the fundamental theorem of calculus, because we can take the antiderivative of a quadratic polynomial. So then you get rid of all that scribbling. So then you repeat that process and you see it's because this quadratic stuff requires three points that we're getting an even number of rectangles. Two intervals gives us the three points we need. So then, We have those next sets of three points, and we and we find the parabola that goes through those three points, and we find the area under the parabola on that interval. And you see, it didn't look so great on the first interval, but you can see here, the parabola is doing a really good job of approximating this curve. It's doing a better job than straight to line segments would be doing. Um, so, Simpson's rule, because it uses these parabolas, tends to be better in like computational senses than the trapezoidal work. But you can't really use Simpson's rule well if you just have a table of data, because one missing observation on that table of data and suddenly Simpson's rule doesn't work because their intervals aren't the same size. Or maybe your intervals aren't the same size anyway, so Simpson's rule doesn't work. Or maybe, you know, or maybe you have the wrong number of observations. You have an uh, even number of observations, and that gives you an odd number of intervals. So Simpson's rule doesn't work. So saying Simpson's rule is better than the trapezoidal rule is kind of deceptive, I think. They each have an area that they excel in. The trapezoidal rule works really well when you have tables of data. Simpson's rule works really well. Keep erasing this dumb integral. Simpson's rule works really well when you just have some integral that you want to find. The midpoint rule always gets taught with Simpson's rule and the trapezoidal rule, but it doesn't have a clear niche like those do. It doesn't work well if you have tables of data. And if you just have an integral like this, Simpson's rule is going to work better. So I think the midpoint rule tends to get taught more out of tradition than because it's a preferred way of finding integrals. And that's numerical integration, or at least that's a two-day summary of a few numerical integration techniques. Um, watch, uh, I'll maybe, hopefully, see you tomorrow. Watch, uh, I guess, you'll probably get 
text messages if anything happens. I mean, if they're not aware, they're predicting a major winter storm uh, tomorrow. So that's why I'm not sure, but but we'll see what happens. I mean, if they don't cancel classes, but you live off campus and it's dangerous to come in, obviously do not come in. Um, I don't want anyone getting hurt for my out to this class.